Thank you. Um, invoking the gurus, I would perhaps uh, begin whatever minimum that I know. Same way what we shared last evening, whatever the grace, the speck of that grace is what we will share here. I am sure as she said that each one of you have come with your own, your own dimensions of understanding the same word that has been written. I think that is how we also say that truth has perspectives and you arrive at that one depending on your own capacity. Always these type of spiritual leaders or gurus, they write something which perhaps is like a well. So you are capable of drawing one pot of water, you are happy, you can be happy. You are capable of drawing five pots of water, you are cap your capability, you can draw it. You want to keep trying it because it's anyway not going to drain out. So you can keep drawing as much as you want to and you are not happy and you are not satisfied with that. That also happens because there is no end to learning as well. So everything depends on how we take it. So the few parts that I have drawn is what I am presenting here of my understanding, my limited understanding on Sri Aurobindo. I call this work itself, the renaissance in India as the Sapta Sutras. Okay, I call it as Sapta Sutras, that's what I have understood. Okay, there are Sapta Sagaras, you know, there are so many sevens that are very, very important. In terms of my understanding of this particular work, I have drawn seven very important elements and them I have called as the Sapta Sutras here. When I say that, it's very important for us to invoke because for him also yesterday I mentioned that he himself says that surrender yourself and then rest will follow. That's exactly what he did in the Alipur jail. That's exactly the type of vision that he got and then subsequently decided that he is taking a different course path. In fact, even today people haven't understood what exactly happened due to which he took a decision like that. A drastic decision to leave everything and then take a different path. Because yesterday also I was saying that some things cannot be explained, some things are just experience. So he had an experience of that sort because of which he never thought he should give an explanation but he thought whatever experiences that he had, he would also share the same thing in the time to come. That's how we prepared millions of people across the world in every other place that we see there is somebody who discovers something from him and he keeps drawing newer people. I am sure half of you must have not been introduced to Arvindo at all. Sri Arvindo must have been known to you with the typical uh, understanding of how we understand our history. What is our understanding of history? If anybody asks you, what is Indus, uh, Indus Valley Civilization? Drainages. This is what we know. Anybody you ask, any student, anyone, tell something about Indus Valley Civilization. Drainages. As if the civilization started with drainage and ended with drainage. Right? This is the state of affairs. Because to come to those drainages that we are talking about, a habitat was built, a choice of habitat was made, to there are hundreds of things that are there. How is it even a civilization should be a first question? Because our critical inquiry hasn't begun there. That's exactly what Sherwindo was doing. He was decolonizing whatever that he had learned because he himself also had that sort of an education. He himself had to unlearn some of the things to learn newer things. And then subsequently what he gave us is this. And you will be mesmerized. I am a teacher of uh, and teacher and a student of international relations. Whenever I read about his works on nationalism and internationalism, the way he has understanding on international relations, I feel mesmerized. He would have made a fantastic professor of international relations. You read something about what he writes on history, you will feel like he is a master of history. The way he talks about some of the minute details in Japan, somewhere in deep, uh, in the countryside of Japan to Greece, somewhere, you know, I don't know where he got this knowledge, but he writes about it when he writes like a historian. Anyway, he is a celebrated philosopher. And apart from that one, the different domains, he is like a rainbow. Even in the rainbow, there is no single color. Every color that we see, we end up thinking, depending on the vision that we have, this is how it is. But in those colors, there are so many shades. And he is the amalgamation of all that. So that's what makes you to, as you go closer and closer to him, 
this is what happens to so many of you are drawn to that one more like a thinker and philosopher not exactly you need not think him as uh, let's say because there where you should not start off with perhaps if you start off with where you think he is a god where you think he is divine perhaps you will get stuck because you are not opening it, uh, up yourself because he himself was not that sort of a person so rationality is a must but along with that one slowly over a period of time when you feel convinced that is better otherwise what happens is on many occasions when i am asked to speak on certain people or certain things i always tell them in fact on many occasions people ask me to talk about miracles then i tell them if i only talk about miracles and you are drawn a better magician comes you will actually get drawn to him or her it's better that you experience and that experience will stay with you that is a much better way of doing so if you, you might be drawn to him just as a philosopher like a guru and then slowly stage you attain the stages that you want to if you are drawn you are drawn if you are not drawn not drawn he loses nothing yesterday also i told you one devotee doesn't pray god loses nothing so his glory will not come down but it is our intention to grow better and do something better that comes in so here first of all he starts off with because this is an issue that all of us are stuck with the idea of identity i think even today if you ask me the greatest theme in indian politics to everything is identity somewhere we assert our identity somewhere we are worried about identity somewhere we are concerned about the erosion of identity at the same time we are confused about which identity to project and which identity to hide this is another confusion we are stuck at a situation where we don't know which identity should be projected so in confusion we don't to some other role we project some other identity when we get stuck so each one of us at different stages don different identities okay when you go abroad when somebody asks you who are you who are you you tell you are an indian am i right inside india if somebody asks you who are you if you say indian they will tell something is wrong with this fellow <laughs> nearby check if there is a hospital am i right at the same time when you go to your state but you can tell you can tell within india that you belong to tamil nadu you belong to karnataka you are a maharashtrian you are a upi whatever the way you want to if you go to that state and when they ask you who you are if you are a maharashtrian and you say i am a maharashtrian they'll think again there is a serious issue that's way it is something to do with our common sense also what to do when to do how to do right and sri arbindo talks about this identity that somewhere we have lost the identity that we are supposed to project but we are stuck with an identity that is unnecessary or we are stuck with an identity that is attached with ego but not actually pride ego and pride are two different things he thinks that this is very important until people understand this part of identity will not be able to go further that's exactly he says you are a reflection of a country that it is generally on its own india will be an abstract component apart from the geography and other things india is called as india or any name calling or anything good calling anything that happens to depends on our behavior right when we say india's identity sri arbindo is talking about every individual's identity the journey that you think of yourself and you think along with the country this is the transition the day you arrive there he thinks that that's why when we behave or misbehave whatever that we do the way media or elsewhere it gets projected indians are like this they don't know that individual's name so that's exactly why he is telling the true indian identity he is talking about individual has to recognize himself or herself with that nation's identity right nation being a cultural terminology he is not talking about state state is a legal terminology anything can be a state once you have legislature executive and judiciary done to be a nation you need to have a feeling and that feeling is called nationalism how does nationalism come it comes in the collective identity where is that collective identity if it is broken you can never be a nation 
So this is how he breaks up to when he is talking about some of these subtle components. He's, he brings in the essence of the true identity and he thinks to overcome these narrow thoughts of identity that are associated. I belong to this caste. I belong to this class. I belong to that. These all these identities. He thinks that you need to be dipped at least once in that spirituality. Spirituality is like a cover. Many times you will see when the metal has to be restrained or metal has to be taken care of there is a particular type of liquid in which they dip and then the process of rusting doesn't happen so Sri Aurobindo thinks that that liquid is spirituality you need to be dipped once into that one then this rustic other component that we are talking about I belong to this 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 narrow identities that we break you will be able to overcome so he says, until you find the true identity, and that true identity you can only find when you are associated with only two components, that one is spiritual, other one is philosophical. Why philosophical? Because we are by birth a dial dialogic subject. This civilization itself is a dialogic subject. Right? Dialogic subject, when I say, the oldest tradition that we have is the Vedic tradition. What the Vedas are all about? Somebody is asking a question, somebody is asking. Prashna, Prashna, Prashna. Am I right? Somebody is asking a question. Somebody is answering the question. He is asking, who is the good student? What is the quality of a student? Somebody is answering, this is the quality of a student. That is how it starts with. When the advantage of dialogue is there, the student will not have doubts in the mind. If it is a monologue, the problem is the monologue continues. And you are already having questions after questions, questions after questions, you dare not asking the question and the doubt remains to be that. In dialogue, advantage is one, it brings democratic values because to dialogue also you need that comfort zone and that comfort zone is called as democracy. It brings that value. Along with that, it brings a tradition where freely you can question and questioning is the basis of everything. Questioning is the basis of rationality. Without questioning, there is no rationality. Take it from me. Because of that, he brings in this thought that we are anyway a dialogic subject. Because our civilization is like that. And on top of it, what does our philosophical tradition say? The Vedas says very, very clearly, Ano Badraha Kratavo Yantu Vishwataha. It says, let the noble thoughts come from any place. Right? Why do they have to say? Right? If you are narrow, Perhaps the Vedas should have ascertained very clearly, this has everything. You don't need to look at anything. Our tradition doesn't belong to that one. That's why we are invoking philosophical tradition. Had it said that everything is in this book, you don't need to look elsewhere. Finished. Why we had to require multiple books? Why so many philosophers? Why so many writings? We would simply say everything is there. We don't need to. Right? Right? That is the part of multiculturalism. That's the thought that he brings in that there is greater diversion, diversity. Everything is available here. And soak yourself in that one and keep yourself open to understand that identity. There is no mono identity here. Mono identity, when I say, it doesn't mean that anything and everything is your identity. You have to be clear about it also. Without that clarity also, you will get washed away. That also should not happen. But you need to identify your identity with a clear whatever that he is asking for. So that philosophical tradition which says Ano Badraha Kratavo Yantu Vishwataha it is saying that let the noble thoughts it is not telling any thought and every thought come in. That noble thought you will find in the philosophical tradition in the spiritual, the spiritual tradition we are talking about. So he says that the difference that we understand between what is colonialism and what is imperialism, in colonialism essentially they come, they attack your culture, they change your values, they give newer norms, they impose their values and they also make you to feel inferior. That's the project. They make you to feel inferior of your spiritual tradition, inferior of your philosophical tradition and then they put that one. In fact, most of the western works that came to India or they wrote about India or when they were questioned that why are they in India, one of the common things that all of them spoke about and said was, we are civilizing the Indians. 
we are civilizing the Easterners. Am I right? This is something that you will normally find even in the 21st century. I will give you classic examples. You must have watched a movie called 300. If you watch the movie called 300, which is about fight in Sparta. Am I right? The Spartans, the 300 Spartans who are shown as the most valorous one. Whom are they fighting with? They are fighting with the Persians. And how is the Persian shown? He is shown like a barbaric. He, they keep telling he is a barbaric one. He is a barbaric one. They are showing him like a, a demon, someone who is uncivilized, who puts a chain. Who puts the chain into nose, you tell me? Who puts a chain around their neck and move around? They show him the most ugliest person against the most beautiful people of Sparta. But who are Persians? Present day Iranians supposed to be the most beautiful people. But we have accepted it. We never questioned this. Because this is the same tradition that they imposed on us that we are uncivilized. Simplest example I give you. When they came here, they saw Indians, they thought we are uncivilized. Because we were using neem stick to brush our teeth. We were using charcoal to brush our teeth. Then we were using rock salt to brush our teeth. 100 years down the lane, Priyanka Chopra jumps into your bathroom and asks, do you have salt in your toothpaste? <laughs> right? International companies are selling you neem toothpaste, charcoal toothpaste, salt toothpaste. And they called us uncivilized. Where did this come from? Is it that Indians did not know about it? We know about it, but we gave consent to feel inferior. That's why people say, nobody can make you feel inferior without your consent. We gave our consent to feel inferior. That's where Arbindo feels bad. Or Shri Arbindo is saying that because that inferiority has come, because you haven't understood the importance of your philosophical and traditional, the spiritual tradition that you are. Because why he says spiritual tradition is, even in yesterday in the Navavida Bhakti I was telling you, after you reach a particular point, nothing matters to you. I was talking about, right, Shankara's quote I was, I was reciting. Satsangatve nisangatvam nisangatve nirmohatvam nirmohatve nishchalatatvam nishchalatatve jivan mukti. What is nishchalatatvam? Nishchalatatvam is nothing can deviate you. Nothing can make you to feel that this is and that is. He says that Nishchalatatva is missing because you are not steadfast. You are not clear. You don't take pride in what you are doing. That's exactly why the colonial rulers came in here. That during the colonial rule there was a loss of confidence. And that confidence is the one which made us to feel inferior about. At the same time do we need to say that we need to feel superior? No. The moment you feel superior, you will stop learning. Because the, the difference between being confident and arrogant is simple. I can do is confidence, I can only do is arrogance. So the moment you feel superior, there is a problem. You don't need to feel superior about it. At the same time, not feeling inferior is equally important. Because not once you feel inferior, they are going to bulldoze you. That's the problem, that's the Western domination. Now, rediscovering and reaffirming the value of Indian spiritual heritage is an essential part of national regeneration. He says, use the word regeneration. Right? Regeneration is almost, he's saying, let's dig up and start fresh. It's not going to happen now. You have, you have taken that inferiority so deep into you, I need to perhaps till the soil again, sow the seeds, start fresh. That's the renaissance he's talking about. Not anything that is superficial. And he also knows that this is not going to be one day or ten days or a one year, ten year project. This is a project forever as long as you have individuals who feel inferior. It's an unending process that Sri Aurobindo talks about. And he says Indian ancient scripture, philosophies and spiritual practices offer profound insights into human nature existence and the universe itself. Much, much before Darwin, in the Indian tradition, the Vedic tradition, Vedas say, 
ಆಕಾಶಾತ್ ವಾಯು ವಾಯೋರಗ್ನಿ ಅಗ್ನೇರಾಪ ಆಪ ಪೃಥಿವಿ ಪೃಥಿವಿ ಔಷಧ ವಾಟ್ ಮೋರ್ ಸೈಂಟಿಫಿಕ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪ್ಲನೇಷನ್ ಯು ರಿಕ್ವೈರ್ ಆಕಾಶಾತ್ ವಾಯು ರೈಟ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದೇರ್ ಕೇಮ್ ದ ವಾಯು ವಾಯೋರಗ್ನಿ ದರ್ ಇಸ್ ನೋ ಫಯರ್ ವಿತೌಟ್ ಏರ್ ಅಗ್ನೇರ್ ಆಪ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದ ಫಯರ್ ಯು ಹ್ಯಾಡ್ ವಾಟರ್ ಆಪ ಪೃಥಿವಿ ಫ್ರಮ್ ವಾಟರ್ ಯು ಹ್ಯಾಡ್ ದ ಅರ್ಥ್ ಪೃಥಿವ್ಯೌಷಧಯ ವೆನ್ ಈಸ್ ಎ ಔಷಧಯ ಇನ್ ಸಂಸ್ಕೃತ ಆರ್ ಇನ್ ಸಂಸ್ಕೃತ್ ಔಷಧಯ ಈಸ್ ಸರ್ವೈವಲ್ ಆರ್ ದ ಸ್ಪೇಸ್ ದಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಕಂಡ್ಯೂಸ್ ಇಫ್ ಆರ್ ಹ್ಯೂಮನ್ ಎಕ್ಸಿಸ್ಟೆನ್ಸ್ ಪೃಥಿವ್ಯೌಷಧಯ ಬಟ್ ವಿ ಥಿಂಕ್ ನೋ ಇಟ್ ಶುಡ್ ಬಿ ರಿಟರ್ನ್ ಇನ್ ಇಂಗ್ಲಿಷ್ ಆರ್ ಇಟ್ ಶುಡ್ ಬಿ ರಿಟರ್ನ್ ಇನ್ ಸಮ್ ಅದರ್ ಲ್ಯಾಂಗ್ವೇಜ್ ಶುಡ್ ಟೇಕ್ ಅ ಡಿಟೋರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಕಮ್ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದೆನ್ ಇಟ್ ಬಿಕಮ್ಸ್ ಅ ಫ್ಯಾಷನ್ ಟಿಲ್ ದೆನ್ ವಿ ವಿಲ್ ನಾಟ್ ರೈಟ್ ದಟ್ಸ್ ಅ ಪ್ರಾಬ್ಲಮ್ so he says and 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 students of politics and other things you can ask them what do you remember of human nature anything about human nature they'll go back to hobbes only the trinity is of western political thought they start with hobbes right who said you are horrible and they want to remember him did we not know that we are horrible everybody is horrible only but the thing is over a period of time because we are humans we will be made to because we have the critical faculty we have critical faculty to think and do certain things much better than animals we progressed long long ago that's how civilizations came without civility where is the possibility of civilization and he is telling in 1500 to you you are horrible you are brutish and then we all accepted yes yes correct sir whatever you say next fellow says you can be little better third fellow says i know you are horrible but mask that we can come into some sort of a social contract and we can all have decency and we'll have governments and we accepted it we thought from there where it all started the trinity of western political thought now he says until you understand your human nature we understood our human nature that's why we were a civilization if we were not a we had not understood human nature there was no necessity to come together there was no necessity to have civility there was no necessity to stay together if the survival of the inter, inter, fittest which is also called in arthashastra as matsya nyaya the bigger fish eating the smaller fish am i right long ago we said about it and we are also a tradition who said kautilya says in his arthashastra there is no happiness for the king by himself the happiness of the king is in the happiness of his subjects prajanaanch hitam rajah there is no other sukha that he can derive only show me a single tradition in the world that says that the ruler has no pleasure by himself but he derives pleasure in the happiness or the pleasure of his subjects i'll give up my profession show me show me a single work that says show me a single work that says your mother is your god no today the whole issue that's going on is about feminist critique to everything that feminine that we are talking about long ago it said when a student is asking in shikshavalli the student is told he is asking who am i what is what i am supposed to do as a student he says veda manu cha charyo ante vasita manushasti right and he goes on telling satyam vada dharman chara now it's very interesting why not dharma first why satya later uh, sorry satya first right dharma is what we are talking about why not dharma first why satya first vedas say because they think first satya satya only can sustain dharma that's why he says satyam vada dharman chara then it goes on further saying then it says matru devo bhava pitru devo bhava acharya devo bhava atithi devo bhava again acharya devo bhava doesn't mean that anybody and everybody just because they taught you are acharyas there is a differentiation there is a lining somebody can be a just adhyapaka also on many occasions we get confused between an adhyapaka and a guru guru is very big word i am telling you guru is the highest level who is a guru right sri arbindo is called as a guru but who is a guru guru is a one who can take that shield off from you agnana timirandasya gnananjana shalakaya chakshurun chakshurun militam mena tasmay guruvennama 
Agnana is timira. Timira is darkness. The one who is capable of pulling you out of Agnana and take towards light, from darkness to light. He alone is Guru, not one who just helped you to pass your exam. He is Adhyapaka. Even to reach the level of Acharya is difficult. But he says here, Acharya Devo Bhava, Atiti Devo Bhava. He goes on talking about which philosophy in the world show me any civilization, any philosophy that says mother is your first god. Again, I'll ascertain, I'll give up my profession. I'll do something else like yesterday. I'll survive in that also. I'm saying I'll do that. I'll give up my profession of being a professor of geopolitics. Am I right? Now that's exactly what Aurobindo is telling. Understand the human nature. Understand the existence. Imagine the day we have, the realization is that you cannot pay back to your mother. And that's called Matrurana. And she is the personification of nature. You will not have violence on women. Right? The moment you realize that Srishti is with her. Yesterday also I told, Shri Pati, just as a Pati has no value. The Shri is first. Shri Nivasa, Shri Man Narayana, all Shri's that we are talking about. No value for them without the Shri first. Am I right? The moment we realize that one, there is no violence on women. Right? We also say a society has matured and there is no violence on women. How does that happen? When you realize that there is already something that is existing that is telling you, you cannot pay back the Matrurana. Am I right? Because in every man also there is femininity. It's the same case with the mother also. Whenever she becomes strict and behaves that way, that time she is exhibiting the masculine. But she comes back. She takes avatars. You know, that's what happens. That should be, uh, or this should be the form of foundation of a renewed Indian identity that's both rooted in tradition and open to modernity. Now, this is very important. Open to modernity is equally important. That we innovate. Otherwise, it will be an end of human civilization. Evolution will not happen. That's the theme that we are talking about. That evolutionary march will stop when you create a meta-narrative and say, this is everything. That open to modernity is that you go on embracing newer ways of doing things, but be deep-rooted. Right? That means you stand on your feet and keep changing the clothes. Don't do the other way around. Don't do Shirshasan and then try changing your clothes. He says, be firm, rooted in your tradition. That means stand on your feet, keep changing the clothes. Right? We keep donning different, different dresses. That's the spiritual thought also. What it says? Deho Devalaya Prokto Jivo Deva Sanatana. Why Jiva is Sanatana? That it keeps going to different bodies. Soul is eternal. Same way modernity is that you stand firm on your feet, keep changing your clothing. But feet should be on the ground only, not the hand. That is when things will start going wrong or it becomes problematic. This is the first of the Sapta Sutras that I am talking about. Second Sapta Sutra is a critique of the Western materialism that he talks about. Okay? This is the second of the Sapta Sutras which is a critique of Western materialism. Now what happens is, in the Western materialism, biggest problem is that it brings a detachment which is a dangerous one. In ours, detachment grows along with that, that feeling of you being one with the eternal. The detachment there is a dangerous one. What it leads to? I had this classic example. I was living in Germany and there were a set of students and we were all traveling to Brussels and uh, I being from elsewhere, I neither had a kitchen nor I was in a position to cook. So, but we were all traveling and then all these students pulled out their sandwiches at some point of time and none of them even asked me, do you want to eat? They ate. No, that's part of their culture. That is their culture. That's okay. But none of them asked. Because their materialism says it like that, you have earned, it is yours, and they also have this 
superior idea of the individual's identity. You know, individual, it has its own advantages, there is no doubt about it. But if it's in a heightened way, then it will be difficult for them to feel for the society that they live with. There is an advantage of the other side. The heights of materialism also I can tell you, in the city of New York, um, the winds blow very heavy. And how American society has become very, very materialistic is, is an example that I have given time and again in my classes as well. That if an American student or an youngster is using an umbrella which costs around $4 uh, because the Chinese make it. So, because Americans have stopped making a lot of things long ago. They have uh, given it to someone else to make because they can afford to. So, it's a $4 one. When the, the umbrella blows up towards back, they pull it out, throw it in the dustbin and buy the next one, another $4. I can do that. What do we do Indians? We pull it and somehow keep it. We take it to the fellow who repairs until that fellow says, I don't want to see your face again, sir. <laughs> don't get this again. I can't repair this. This is the end. I can't do anything. Till then, somehow we'll have hope and we'll keep going there. You know, this is inbuilt in the tradition that we belong to because by nature, we are conservatives to preserve the nature. Mark my words. I say, by nature, we are conservatives to preserve the nature. Because materialism, the first one that is going to get affected is nature only. And nature is mother. Prakriti. That's why by default, by default, we are conservatives. When you move for dinner or breakfast or lunch to the dining table, if you are coming from your room, first thing, whether you do it or not, your parents go and do is switch off the light and fan. Right? Now this is inbuilt. We think, so you can't, you, you don't expect her to tell this is a national waste and why are you doing this one, this country is struggling, it has to grow like this. She won't tell all those things. But by nature she does that one. Now that conservatism has actually saved us. But people are not aware, when you ask your mother, why did you do that one? She will tell you a silliest reason that power bill will come more. Current bill is going to kill us. That's what she's going to tell. But you go deconstruct. Because you love Western political thought. We'll go to people like Jack West Derrida, whosoever you want to. Deconstruct the process, you will understand it has something to do with nature only. It has something to do with preserving something. And that's the beauty. That's why by nature we are conservatives to conserve the nature. That is what we end up doing. Now that is very important because the moment you become materialistic society, you will start having this audacity to abuse the nature. And you will not have value for the nature, but at the same time, you have not got any right to destroy something for the next generation. You have to be responsible for the coming generation. Because one of the biggest damages that materialistic nature does is that it makes you or gives you an audacity to abuse and you leave nothing. What if your previous generation had left nothing for you in the nature or in society to consume? It would have been horrible. So as much we expect or we every time think about our previous people, it's the same thing that our next generation will be asking for. And that's one of the reasons because materialism is also the whole uh, bhakti movement in the country is all about this materialist component. That one, one of the beauty of Indian tradition is every time we cross a line and then we go to the extreme, something will happen. Somebody will come, try working on that one. And they, will, they themselves will set as an example. Yesterday, a small portion I tried singing that was by Purandara Dasa. His name was Srinivas Nayaka. You know, Srinivas Nayaka was a gold merchant. He was miser. He was stingy. He would not even give anything to anyone. He was like that. And then one day, Krishna appeared to his wife in as if he's, he's starving and he's some sort of a person who's on the road. He asks her that I'm in a pathetic condition. Give me something. The wife says, I have nothing. He says, don't tell me a lie. He says, she says, I'm not telling you lie. My husband doesn't trust me. He has not kept a single penny anywhere in the house. He thinks that I will end up giving in charity. 
So he has made sure that he has locked everything. There is nothing that is available. So smartly Krishna says, you have a nose ring. Don't tell me that you don't have anything. If you have willingness to give, you can give me. So the poor lady actually gives off. And what Krishna does, he goes to his, his shop only. He goes to Srinivas Naika's shop and he wants to sell that one to that fellow only. So he gets shocked because that's an unique one. That's his wife's. So he says, now I, this is my wife's. This is mine. He says, you wait here. I'll just go and come back. He goes home and then he starts charging at wife. Where is your nose ring? Show me. And she says, it's here only somewhere. She also doesn't know where, what to tell him. He's going to beat her up or he's going to get angry. She says, near the photograph in the shrine, I've kept it. I think it is there only. He says, you wait here. I will go check. He directly goes to check there. He finds one. That's a moment of redemption. And that day he gives up everything. All the materialistic thing that he thought with one instance, his whole ego is gone. He becomes Purandara Dasa. He gives up everything. Then he goes on writing. He's called as the Pitamaha of Carnatic music. He gives up everything. And then he goes on to imagine from being a miser and being like that, being materialistic, he goes on to say, Enu madida renu prana ninna do swami. He says, whatever I do, the prana in me is in your hand. The moment you pull, I am done. That's what he says and ends. Why? It is a message to the society, however rich you are, however materialistic you are, the moment that time comes in, realize, pull back. This is what the whole Bhakti Marga did or the renaissance that we had in India, this is exactly what happened. So Sri Aurobindo is actually talking here and very very clearly says that the moment you become or you become slaves of western materialism which has no value for either the previous generation or the generations to come, what will happen is we will become utilitarians. Once we become utilitarians, we become superficial because materialism makes you to drown yourself in that ego that you, you, you. Every time anybody, anybody, anything they ask, you say, I, I, I. That's why our spiritual leaders in India have said, even when you are asking for peace, say peace only. Right? When you are taught the Shanti Mantra, the Shanti Mantra says, Om Shanti, Om Shanti, Om Shanti. He, only it says, in English if you say, I want peace, then immediately they said that I is an ego. Get rid of it. That I, you are doomed in. So that leads to that materialistic feeling that everything belongs to you and you will continue to do whatever you want to. Then we will have many instances that can threaten us because that brings us that, that quality. So he says, he argues that they lead to a superficial as well as fragmented understanding of the life itself. Then he also says that India's spiritual philosophy offers a holistic and integrated perspective that can address limitations of materialism. The limitations of materialism, they go on digging whatever that you are finding. Right? Something that you have found as natural resource. Go dig as much as, how many days you will dig, how many years you will dig. There is a point where it stops. What you will do? You are finished. That's one of the reasons why West Asian states, whether it's UAE, Saudi Arabia, all these people are trying to diversify because they know that this materialism that they are stuck with, this wealth that they are stuck with, with the oil or gas or whatever that is, that's going to get evaporated one day. Then what will you eat? And also Indian materialism or Indian spiritualism teaches you that at times of crisis, whatever you thought is the greatest position or possession might be of no use. Right? Classic example, look at what has happened in Vainad. People were super rich, it was gulf money. Right? All the wealth, acres together, house, everything was there. They felt, I am the king of this place. One day, nature's fury. Now, they have millions of money in their bank. Nobody is giving them a piece of bread. Yesterday one of the political leaders went because of his security. They closed all the shops and everything for few hours. People were furious and then they were shouting because hunger doesn't listen to your status. 
that's why my bank account has 15 crores now i need a piece of bread not even a loaf of bread i'm asking for a piece of bread nothing so materialism has a limitation you are in a forest you need food you have money even that money will you eat the paper after all it's paper to fill your hunger will you eat paper you cannot so simplest of the examples he says this is a limitation there is a limitation to materialism that will perhaps make you to repent so much or it can take you to a situation where there is where there is no return that's the danger that you will go through so western approaches often prioritize economic and technological progress at the expense of spiritual and moral development this is exactly what we are asking modernity when he says or development when he says that development that's for the human kind that's for the society what would have happened to the world if we had not discovered nuclear weapons nuclear bombs that's an ugly expression of an individual's ego what would have happened if science is not meant for society and only for your own satisfaction what is big deal about it i tell in my class of research methodology that scientists end up thinking that once they discovered something something has happened lack of evidence doesn't mean evidence is lacking apple fell before also apple fell after that also you discovered and you had a realization that day till then you thought that it did not exist or you thought you created something am i right it was happening it will continue to happen you had a realization that for that moment that's all nothing more than that right evidence is not lacking for you at that moment you could not find an evidence that's the difference so here technological progress that is for the mankind not exactly a technological development that we are talking about which limits you and rest of your life you are threatened about what will happen to them that's not the place that we are looking at so in contrast he says indian philosophy or spirituality emphasizes on the inner growth and unity of life promoting a more balanced and harmonious development from gandhi to everyone in fact gandhi had a problem with railways lawyers doctors right it's very interesting why should this man have problem this is what even sherbindo talks about when he says materialism and all these things that he is talking about okay now these are the tools of materialism your materialism is progressed when you have a possibility to transport them from place to place and that's what these facilitated actually but when we say then what is the problem with doctors now see again ayurveda when we say which is part of our tradition it is not just about getting a medicine when you are sick it is about observing yourself in ayurveda we only have three components kapha pitta vata you are a combination of one of those it can be a combination of pitta and kapha kapha and vata whatever that is where do they say that right? you walk up to a english medicine doctor now how many of you love samosas i think most of you that's why nobody is raising hand it's a temptation now what happens is some of you might feel that whenever you take samosas actually you have acidity i certainly feel that i when i eat samosas i feel acidic or any other one which we really like but it's very acidic after that you have to follow something so we walk up to a doctor and say a uh, english medicine doctor and say that give me something that i am feeling acidic first of all the direct the doctor doesn't directly meet you he'll ask you a pg to do something and after that he will meet he'll write jalusil take three times basically what he is doing is he is giving you an audacity to commit a crime again and again on your body you know it's acidic body cannot take it but here english medicine doctor is telling you have the samosa take 30 ml or whatever jalusil then you will get rid of it that's why these people said when your body constitution is resisting something and you continue to do that one they are the ones who lead to newer types of diseases so you go to a ayurvedic doctor what will he suggest first he will give you a sheet and he will say identify your body prakriti prakriti and nature are not same okay 
Prakriti is a loaded terminology in Sanskrit. So he says, identify your Prakriti within the Kapha, Pitta, Vata, but you are not specialized. Write whatever you feel at different, different occasions. So then he will diagnose and he will say, perhaps most of the time he might say you, stop this, stop eating this. But that's exactly what we don't want to do. So we don't like Ayurveda because he asked me to stop. If he is asking me to stop, then why should I go to him? My exact issue is that I want to have that. So English medicine is better. I will eat, I will take Jalusel. What is there in that one? He says, that's an abuse, that's an audacity that they have given you to commit something on your body again and again. That is materialism. Then newer diseases. Right? Then one after the other newer diseases come. Maybe some of the elders who are sitting here, their time, one doctor only used to do everything. That fellow will only give medicine for all diseases of you. Now within orthopedics today, we have somebody who look for different type of injuries. There is sports injury, there is back shram, there is somebody else. Different, different branches within orthopedics itself. Right? Why? So you showed that audacity, no? We showed that audacity, newer branches and newer branches, specialization, in the name of specialization, we have got all that. That means equally we are also accepting that the society is sick. That sickness has something to do with materialism. It has something to do with not respecting what has come to you with nature. Each one of us are born with certain qualities and certain types of body that are given to us. And you cannot violate that one. Once you start doing that, you are going against the nature. Till a point it's okay. Till a point for a very long years, we took off or we even diverted the waters, we diverted the rivers, we constructed mountains, what is sorry, artificial places, estates, everything. So 20, 30 years nothing happened. We thought we succeeded against the nature. People kept threatening us saying that will happen, this will happen. One day it came and washed away three villages. You don't even know how did they look. You have to put before, after now. Am I right? Now that's exactly the problem here because he uses the word balanced and harmonious. That's why people have said time and again, you have enough for your need, not for your greed. Why do they say that? That's the balance. That's exactly the balance that he is telling and harmonious. You need to, tomorrow morning you face, you're going to face again. Have a harmonious relationship and use how much you require. Don't abuse. Right? Just a extra A, B comes there, that's all. Use, no problem. Don't abuse. The moment you abuse, you are losing out on the harmonious development itself. The third sutra is the need for spiritual renaissance. Again he says, he emphasizes on the renaissance that must be primarily spiritual. After that it can build on other things, but primarily it has to be spiritual. And then he says that true strength of Indian culture lies in its spiritual depth that any revival effort must center around reawakening of the spiritual consciousness and the spiritual renaissance involves reviving ancient practices I just mentioned to you ancient practices and value that promote self-realization compassion universal harmony universal harmony is where he is essentially telling you don't be narrow don't be narrow you yours this much only have the thought there is a famous poet in Canada who says Elliyu nilladiru he says, don't stop anywhere. He says, don't build house. That means, don't settle down. The moment we build house, attachment. That attachment doesn't allow you to travel. That doesn't allow you to. You are traveling somewhere with your family. Your whole thought is here only. Is the CCTV working? Is the gold safe? Is the money safe? Hope somebody has not entered the house. This much only. He says the idea of the house or material that he is telling you is that you get stuck there. Maneya nendu katta diru. Guriya nendu mutta diru. He is saying don't attain goal. Because the moment you attain goal you feel saturated. Ah, nothing else I need to do. He says keep extend your goal. That means try going till that eternity which you cannot attain. So keep extending your goal 
ಸೊ ಗುರಿಯನೆಂದು ಮುಟ್ಟದಿರು ನೀ ಅನಂತವಾಗಿರು ಯು ವಿಲ್ ಬಿಕಮ್ ಪಾರ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಎಟರ್ನಲ್ ದಟ್ ಎಟರ್ನಿಟಿ ಯು ವಿಲ್ ಅಚೀವ್ ಓನ್ಲಿ ವೆನ್ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಗೆಟ್ ರಿಡ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಅದರ್ ಪಾರ್ಟ್ ದಟ್ಸ್ ಎಕ್ಸಾಕ್ಟ್ಲಿ ಇಸ್ ಸೇಯಿಂಗ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ದಟ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಲ್ ಹಾರ್ಮನಿ ಕಮ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ಏಬ್ ಕೇಪಬಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಡೂಯಿಂಗ್ ದಟ್ ನೌ ದಿಸ್ ರಿವೈವಲ್ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಪೈರ್ ಅದರ್ ಆಸ್ಪೆಕ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಲೈಫ್ ಇನ್ಕ್ಲೂಡಿಂಗ್ ಆರ್ಟ್ ಲಿಟ್ರೇಚರ್ ಸೈನ್ಸ್ ಪಾಲಿಟಿಕ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇಟ್ ಲೀಡ್ಸ್ ಟು ವಾಟ್ ವಿ ಕಾಲ್ ಆಸ್ ಮೋರ್ ಎನ್ಲೈಟೆಂಡ್ ಸೊಸೈಟಿ ನ್ಯಾಷನಲ್ ಇಂಟ್ರೆಸ್ಟ್ ಈಸ್ ನ್ಯಾರೋ ಎನ್ಲೈಟೆಂಡ್ ನ್ಯಾಷನಲ್ ಇಂಟ್ರೆಸ್ಟ್ ಈಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ವಿ ರಿಕ್ವೈರ್ ಎನ್ಲೈಟೆಂಡ್ ನ್ಯಾಷನಲ್ ಇಂಟ್ರೆಸ್ಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಐ ವಿಲ್ ಲೀವ್ ಬಟ್ ಐ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ವಾಂಟ್ ಯು ಟು ಲೀವ್ ಐ ವಾಂಟ್ ಟು ಗ್ರೋ ಬಟ್ ಐ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ವಾಂಟ್ ಯು ಟು ಗ್ರೋ ಐ ವಾಂಟ್ ಟು ಶೈನ್ ಐ ವಾಂಟ್ ಯು ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಟು ಶೈನ್ ಐ ವಾಂಟ್ ಟು ಈಟ್ ಐ ವಾಂಟ್ ಯು ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಟು ಈಟ್ it cannot be that that's exactly what we are reflecting even now right what if there was a vaccine nationalism that i have prepared i'll keep it for myself what would have happened to the world am i right this side of problem is very narrow that's why national interest might be telling that keep for yourself your people feed here but there is something about universal harmony what if sri arvindo had said that i will awaken only indians another greatest human being would not have am i right she would not have been here had he decided had he been that narrow saying that i am for indians only indians awakening i'll i'll be responsible for that's not what it meant to be it meant to be that if i feel that i have a value my civilization has a value that value should spread to everyone that value should go everywhere so that as much goodness spreads that good is for the world that's why when she came here she was drawn to him i think she says like that a, a typical terminology she uses i have forgotten when she went to japan it's almost saying like my soul is here but i physically went to japan and even she had some health problems i suppose when she was living in japan during the first world war right and then subsequently she comes back 1920 she said this is the end this is the destination because she had seen a vision whom she calls as sri arbindo she had seen a vision but she would not know what exactly it is and this is her final destination that's where she stopped because she found a guru and that's sharanagati no question of questioning she just surrendered that's all at the master's lotus feet done till the last breath right so many people came there are there are people who say as insiders that there was uh, a situation mrs gandhi used to be very ardent follower of the mother she came and then mother told her how to go about the 1971 war this is what they say and she had her as a close confidant and then she had to take her i think she would cry out to her lot of things were there about and she says that she did not do anything till sri arbindo was there he did everything she says till 1950 he did everything after that i had to just take it forward right that's the harmony that that they found at some point of time to have an enlightened society which is equally important the fourth one is the synthesis of the old and the new this is also something that you find in the work that that is about the renaissance where he argues for a synthesis of the ancient indian tradition and modern advancements because you cannot say no to modern advancements that's a problem whether you agree or not it will happen modern advancements may have their own adverse effects or whatever that is you need to see how you can blend them and then take them forward because he believed that india should not reject modernity but should integrate it with its own culture and spiritual heritage to create a unique path, unique path of progress itself how do you because you have to keep innovating you cannot be parochial you cannot be parochial you cannot be getting stuck somewhere you need to come up with newer ways of now what is this synthesis because there will be a thesis there will be an antithesis but it has to at some point of time lead to synthesis only there is no other way there will be a thesis there will be an antithesis when hinduism or what we call as sanatana dharma was there that was that put up a thesis jainism and buddhism came with antithesis 
again Shankara came and brought it to synthesis. If Buddhism was revolution, right? Shankara did a counter revolution. What, how did he do? By making sure that his own religion also, all the faults and other things that it had, it will correct itself, accept certain things that were modern to that time and then put it in the straight line. That was the job that he was supposed to do. Not saying that whatever there itself is correct and I will not change, I will be like this only. In fact, Shankara had a very interesting scenario in his own life. There was once he is walking in the north and then somebody appears in front of him like a chandala. Chandala is basically someone who works in a graveyard. And then Shank his students and others say, move aside. Shankar also says, why are you blocking my path? Why are you coming this way? Move, move aside. And their idea is basically telling that you are unclean. So the chandala asks him back, oh, are you talking about Antaranga Shuddhi or Bahiranga Shuddhi? Shankara leaves his danda and prostrates in front of him. Vandanam that we spoke about yesterday. Humility comes when you are able to accept. Realization comes. So Shankara prostrates in front of him and he says, Realization. You are my Guru. That's why the idea of Guru is very tricky. For someone, that person may look like a madcap. Yesterday I was telling you, lot of people felt when Swami Vivekananda was going or Mother Sharada was there, what are these fellows going to this eccentric fellow, this hyper fellow called Ramakrishna? For them he was a Guru because you Guru and the Shishya, that connection is very unique and very personal. It may not transcend to someone else. There is no universality in that component. Universality is with the gods. Universality is only with the gods. But with others, universality might not be there. But we can elevate ourselves. Or we can go from guru to, we can take them to next level. I was talking about Sri Aurobind also. So we can elevate and we can go there. But the thing is that person will look like that to that person only. Because it is about their own experience. That individual experience is very, very important. That's exactly what happens here. So he says, the synthesis involves adopting modern science, technology and social systems while being guided by what we call as the Indian spiritual values. It ensures that modernization does not lead to cultural erosion, but strengthens national identity. You might have seen upstairs, we have preserved or Dr. Shruti and her whole team has done something like a museum there with the old maps and all that thing. What have they used? They've used technology to revive something that is cultural. How would they, from where she will get on earth some, some of those oldest maps, how will she draw many of those things? From where she would get? Even the life-size photo that we have, 10 foot uh, photograph of Sri Aurobindo that is there, which Dr. Ananda Reddy dreamt of. How has that come there? Technology. There is nothing wrong in technology, but it depends on the use of technology. What you want to do with technology. That's why we keep telling disruptive technology. For technology, it doesn't differentiate. Right? When it goes to the hand of, when our soldiers are holding an AK-47, it shoots against the enemies. But at the same time, when a terrorist also is holding, it doesn't discriminate. Technology doesn't discriminate. It is the individual who has created technology. Individual has to use what we call as discriminatory knowledge. Discriminatory knowledge is called as Hamsakshiranyaya. Hamsakshiranyaya is that if you give a swan with a bowl of milk mixed with water, the swan will only take the milk. Because in the world always there exists good and bad. If the bad doesn't exist, there is no value for good. If everybody is good, it's very difficult to say, this person is good. What am I? Then that fellow will ask. Am I right? So there exists. That is the nature. That is the nature. That is how state of things are. But you need to know what to take, what not to take. That's where the discriminatory knowledge comes into us. So, when Sri Aurobindo says, use no technology, everything is a technology. This was a dream. This was a dream that now you are able to see. We were not fortunate to be or live in the era that such great gurus lived. Am I right? But at least we are able to live. 36 volumes on Sri Aurobindo. How did that come? Technology. What's wrong in that? 
so technology you can use for the progress of society we can preserve lot of things that we have done in the past as well all those things that we are able to preserve and bring back now that's the future orientation perhaps i'm keeping for the next uh, next few minutes after we finish this part is essentially what i'm trying to say that it is required for the preservation of the culture as well and technology you cannot deny that denial is not going to change anything it's like climate change for a long time the countries which are developing and countries which have developed this used to be an issue the moment somebody would talk about climate change they would say this is between the haves and the have nots the developed have already enjoyed everything and they are not allowing the developing ones to become developed enjoy for some time but already they are restricting us this is what they said true fact everything is absolutely clear unfortunately climate change doesn't think that way climate change doesn't differentiate between the haves and the have nots it happens that's like the karma theory on many occasions we feel what have i done for which i am going through this right bangladesh hasn't done anything to go through what it goes through when climate change affects it being a lower riparian state right it doesn't have done anything but there is an upper riparian state called china there is a middle riparian state called india a lower riparian state called bangladesh so for no mistake of them they suffer their enclaves go down climate change doesn't differentiate karma also doesn't differentiate what is it it has to happen it will happen so how do we overcome that one that's where human mind is that's where we need to think about so he says for these type of problems in society that's how we need to interpret him right for these type of society for the goodness for the wellness and betterment of society use technology use science use science use technology don't be disassociated so social systems while being guided by indian spiritual values that's the difference between how do you use the science for what you use the science is your discrimination knowledge do you want to give an ugly expression of your ego or you want to work for the society choice is yours nobody is going to stop you now it ensures that modernization doesn't lead to cultural erosion but strengthens nation's identity itself okay that we will see when we look at the legends in the intellectual realm the role of education again this is the fifth one the education plays a very very crucial role in india's renaissance itself why he says not knowledge and not wisdom am i right sherbindo doesn't say that you need to have knowledge you need to have wisdom but he says education but he thinks that first education should be there when education finds its saturation or finds its culmination then you will progress into that's the stage first is education then is knowledge and then is wisdom that's why very few people we say they are knowledgeable and rarest of the people we say they have wisdom am i right not everybody has wisdom and a person who is knowledgeable need not be educated but a knowledge with education makes you skillful a person who makes pot he is not educated he has not gone to pondicherry university am i right a goldsmith hasn't been to a international school of making but he has knowledge but when he has knowledge and education he gets certified his skill is exhibited or his skill gets a value and he also learns how to do more systematically that's the thought here but when you are able and capable of moving beyond that then you attain wisdom which is very difficult which is also the highest level in the ladder that will also happen here so that's the reason he says that education is important he advocates for an educational system that nurtures the spiritual intellectual and artistic faculties of individual that's why i told you why education is important is also because we have flawed education otherwise we would have not said indus valley civilization means drainages we would have not said that if your education was proper if our education was clear we would have not said that would have said so many other things about indus valley civilization because that's what the western education has done to us this is a question that i keep asking students also some duke ferdinand got killed 
So in some Central European country, we called it as World War. Right? Latin America, the whole Americas did not get involved. Africa was not involved. Asia was not involved. Turkey always has a confused uh, identity whether they are part of Europe or West Asia, whatever that is. Right? Whole of Asia is not involved. Pacific is not involved. Antarctica is not involved. Australia is not involved. Europe is also not fully involved. There is a small portion that is involved. They call it as World War. And we also agreed. We also agreed. And if you walk in this beach, in the path, you will also find a war memorial. Because for no reason, 72,000 Indians also lost their life in First World War. But Europeans said, it, it has taken 75 years for us to tell that Europe's problem is not everybody's problem. 75 years. It has taken us to stand on our back and say, Europe's problem is not everybody's problem. When we were questioned that how can you support a country like Russia where you have a dictator called Putin and you are buying oil from them, you are buying petroleum products from them, you are buying that, these, you know, we said, don't give me gyan. What you buy in an afternoon, I buy for a whole month. Set your house right. Then tell me. It has taken 75 years to tell us or tell them. Education is important. We had education, no? 47 onwards also, we had education. Why is that education is making a difference here? Right type of education is important. He sitting there as a diplomat and also subsequently as a minister is not just showing his ego, but at the same time is educating masses. He's telling them, show your spine. Don't be a snail. That's not what we meant for. Right? And that strength comes when you have education and that education becomes knowledge. From knowledge you move to wisdom. Right? And all this if you can achieve also with spirituality that brings humility. When you have humility you will have growth. When you have growth that will be a sustainable growth. That's the way we talk about. So he believes that education should be rooted in Indian culture while also incorporating global knowledge. Because first I said opening remarks of the Vedas. You cannot deny the existence of the world and the knowledge that is existing in else, elsewhere. All over, as long as humans have been there, there has been some or the other production of knowledge somewhere and we can learn from that and there is nothing wrong. An education that system that reflects the cultural and spiritual values of India can produce individuals who are well-rounded, ethically grounded and capable of leading the nation towards a renaissance. That's why when we say dharma, the easiest terminology or the meaning for dharma is goodness. There are so many other things that are there with the idea of dharma. Right? In your own villages, when somebody who has been doing lot of charity, he has been very good a person and all that thing, people tell someone like dharmaraya passed away. Right? Yudhishthira essentially. See? Dharmaraya passed away. Actually speaking in Mahabharata, the one who has done so much of sacrifice and charity is karna. Why they don't say someone like Karna passed away? Why do they say someone like who did not do any charity, but why they still say someone like a Dharmaraya passed away or Dharmaraja passed away? Because the thought of Dharma is being good first. Charity comes next. That's why when Karna is in that critical situation when he is trying to lift the wheel, he shoots back and he says, is this righteousness? When I am in trouble, when I am pulling up, is this dharma what you are doing? Krishna says, dharma is not convenience, karna. Dharma, you cannot invoke at convenience. That day, when Draupadi was getting stripped, you were laughing. So many occasions, you have done so many other things. That day you did not ask me, is this dharma? You are invoking when you are in crisis. This is what happens to each one of us also. Right? The moment we fail, the moment we are unable to do something, we ask God, why me? Why do you do this? Good happens, we never ask him, why me? We think we deserve it. Am I right? When good happens, we never ask God, did I really deserve? We never even enter, enter into, oh, thank you God. Chalo. Bad happens, we accuse him. 
this is the reason when somebody was asking me once saying that this is this is something that i'm taking from sri arvindo because he was heavily influenced by krishna from the gita this is very interesting because krishna says that you do your duty leave the fruits to me why will i do the duty and leave the fruits to him i will work and he will take the fruits simplest question right i deliver the lecture vote of thanks should be to me why vote of thanks to you people <laughs> but first of all there should be somebody to tell you something what will you listen in silence tell me what will you listen in silence if nobody is listening also i can record right so simplest question why this is exactly what krishna says whatever today is a buzzword called depression mental health and all these things what happens with failure is you get into depression you start self doubting that i am worthless i am this much only one upsc failure done and my life is over that's all i am useless right you start feeling you start all the self love component goes off you start telling you are useless i don't think i should survive here that these and everything right that's a very dangerous situation when you get into depression when you start having self doubts the way arjuna had also got self doubt so many things same way you got get get self doubt and you want to kill yourself you want to do so many things suicidal thoughts depression so many other thing krishna says good or bad leave it on me good comes anyway without my permission you will take credit bad happens throw it on me we need somebody to blame that's why god exists so he says leave it on me take the good whether i tell or not you will take it but leave the bad to me don't get into depression don't have mental health issue that's why he says karmanye vadikaraste ma phaleshu kadachana don't expect anything just do your karma leave it to me this is a very important question right why should we leave the fruits to him why should he have all the fun like the we asked no why should boys have all the fun in the same way why should he has all the fun why should he have all the fun now this education should inspire creativity critical thinking and deep understanding of india's heritage itself we go to the last two one is national self confidence he says when individual has self confidence that will reflect in the national self confidence vyashti samashti parameshti vyashti is the lowest level our level samashti is like the civil society or the society that we live in from there your entities it's like you are local then you become national then you become global if at lowest level all itself you are stuck and you are unable to go beyond you will never be able to be at the level of national when you are unable to reach the national you will never reach the global so vyashti samashti parameshti that's what he is talking about so at individual level when you have self now the five that i spoke about about the sapta sutras the five are about individual growth now he moves on to national when you are strengthened with the five you move because you have to contribute to that that is your identity i told you when you go abroad you are an indian you are not so and so because even if you assert and say i am so and so i am nand kishor what nand kishor which nand kishor they will ask you how much ever you assert all i am dr nand kishor with a phd i am dr nand kishor with a post doc i am dr nand kishor with fellowship all that fine is fine bhai who are you again they'll ask you this question so that national identity because till now you have contributed to yourself now you contribute to the next level so that national identity is exhibited in the form of national confidence he says which is extremely important because indians should regain or must regain their pride in their culture and achievements to counter the colonial mindsets and devalues those things that devalues the indian tradition colonizers have left we are mentally colonized that is the problem if i am introduced as dr nand kishor head of the department department of politics pandicherry university 
You think, chalta hai. It's okay, another fellow is coming and delivering lecture. Dr. Nankishore, head of the department, Pondicherry University, politics and so and so, he has been a recipient of Erasmus Mundus from European Union. <laughs> International Visitor Leadership Program of the US State Department. <laughs> oh, serious, he must be a good speaker. That's colonial mindset. We still have this problem. Whichever horrible, most horrible university he goes and does PhD and he returns also to the country is a foreign return. You know, he has a greater value when he goes to an interview. This is a universal value in our country. This is a mindset that we all have. Colonizers have left. Imagine that we still take pride. That's why I keep telling those people who say death to America, that, this and all this, tomorrow you are getting full bright. How many of you are writing death to America, I am not taking full bright fellowship? How many of us are ready to write? Down with America, you are a colonizer or you are an imperialist country, you went to Afghanistan, you went to Iraq, you did that, you did this, you are bad, I am not taking full bright fellowship. With your hand on the heart, tell me you are rejecting. How many of you have that courage to do so? 250 years they ruled over us, they colonized us, they made us to go to the most brutal ways. They did not even treat us like humans. They wrote Indians and dogs are not allowed into, uh, allowed into this premises. They give you a fellowship to enter UK. How many of you will say, this is the country that colonized, I will not go? Tell me. We haven't grown beyond that. That's why I said, I don't make any statement without ascertaining certain things or without facts. If we haven't grown beyond that one, that means we are colonized. I'm no way saying it's wrong for you to go or anything of that sort. But I'm saying that there where still the value is. There where still everything is. That includes me as well. I'm not excluding myself. Okay, this is the problem. A renewed sense of self-confidence is crucial for India's development. And that called self-confidence comes if only you realize that in the past we achieved everything. Have you found an instance where Indians have gone for a spiritual seeker to Europe or America? Have Indians gone for, gone to Europe or United States because they found a spiritual guru? Any instances you have found? They have wealth, no? They are a developed country. Haves and the have-nots. Everything is there. Why is it that they only come here? Why is it that they only come here? We haven't gone there for seeking. That's the simplest logic is also. We are not believers, but we are seekers. And seeking is a never-ending process. It's a never-ending process. Because that's the strength until the day we find that we have solutions here and we are capable of doing things and we need to revive those things, there is no possibility to go forward at all. And that's the self-confidence which is required for national self-confidence because your reflection is the national self-confidence. Individual self-reflection is India's national confidence. Now by valuing their own heritage, India can resist cultural imperialism and contribute more effectively to global progress itself. Now, universal relevance of Indian spirituality is the last one in the Sapta Sutras which I talk about. He suggests spiritual traditions have universal relevance. Because Indian spiritual values never tell that you do something to someone. Never says. None of the values will ever say. I mentioned to you people about the Vedas saying something about treat the mother, father, teacher, the visitor, everyone. Tell me anybody can say this is horribly negative. We haven't even ascertained that we know everything. That's also truth. Have we ascertained that we know everything, only come to us. Nobody knows anything. No problem. So, this is one of the reasons why we say the unity, harmony, transcendence. Now, especially since G20 has come, I think you have all been bombarded with the thought of Vasudeva Kutumbakam. That's why I'm not even talking about it. Because that's, there is a paradox in that also, in the modern era. We say Vasudeva Kutumbakam and tomorrow somebody from Myanmar says, Sir, you said 
whole world is your family, can I come there? <laughs> right? Modern nations, these are rhetorics. These are problems. How much ever we say, Vasudaiva Kutumbakam, we don't like uninvited guests. We don't even like invited guests creating nuisance. Am I right? So when we say Vasudaiva Kutumbakam, it's a feeling. But that feeling to become reality, we need a lot of time. That's a difficulty. And at the same time, in the principles of Indian spirituality, such as non-dualism, which I spoke yesterday as Advaita, universal brotherhood and the pursuit of inner growth, the, it can address many of the world's conflicts and crises as well. In one of my talks in the Arbindo Society, um, one uh, devotee actually got up from the West. She asked me that, uh, can India give a solution to the problems between Russia and Ukraine? Very practical question. I said it can, but it has its own limitations also. Am I right? Somebody should be in a position to listen to the other side. Now I am speaking, either you are forced or you are interested in whatever that is, there is a given environment here. The other side doesn't even listen to. In such cases, what you can do? And secondly, in international relations and in life also, knowing the extent of our power is important, but knowing the limitations of power is also important. What we are capable is very important, what we are not capable is also very important. That is reality. And that reality is equally important. So that's why in Indian Renaissance, therefore, has the potential to inspire and guide global culture and spiritual evolution. When your universal principles or your spiritual principles or your heritage and philosophical tradition never say do something wrong. Paropakaraya punyaya papaya parapedanam. This is what our philosophy says. Doing good to others is your job. If cannot, keep quiet. It also says that. You cannot hurt them. If you can't help, at least don't hurt. Paropakaraya punyaya. That means, when you do paropakara to someone, you accumulate goodness. The punya from that one. Punya doesn't mean, it's like a basically bank balance in the, in the karma theory. But it also doesn't mean that it will be revived somewhere else and all. They are not taking to that level. Paropakaraya punyaya. Immediately they say, if you hurt someone and trouble someone, Papaya parapidanam, because that papa is very, very important. Until and unless human societies have that fear of sin, you cannot control. All over the world, all religions, idea of sin is the one which has ruled. And those religions that did not talk about sin, their existence itself is questioned. You can talk about that they are stuck in small places. Those religions that spoke about the sin have grown and they have been there everywhere. Here also it says that one only. Papa Bhiti, Daiva Preeti, Sanghaniti. This is what he spoken about. First is the fear of sin only. Then only Daiva Preeti. Then only love for God. Right? Otherwise you cannot manage societies. Constitutions cannot manage societies. Penal codes cannot manage societies. Your day-to-day regular life and other things, you are restrained from doing wrong things because of the fear of sin only most of the time. What will happen to you? What will happen to my children? Somebody else. This is how it happens. Even with that Papa Bhiti itself, we have this much of corruption and this much of problem. Imagine even that was not existing. What would have been our condition? So the fear of sin is a very important one. That has to happen. And it, it will be there because that is the one which will bring us to so that it contains or it manages the life that we have. The small this thing will just look at India's strong intellectual tradition and then I'll stop for your question answers. Ancient philosophical thought, you have the Astika and the Nastika component. You have the Vedanta, you have Sankhya, you have Yoga, you have Nyaya and Vaisheshika and the last one you have is Purva Mimamsa. Now all these things are equally important. Each of them have, the first one starts off with the roots in the Vedanta. That means, sorry, the Vedanta has roots in the Upanishad. Upavishat in Sanskrit is sit closer to me. Upanishad is also sitting close to the teacher and learning from the teacher. And that process is very important. In Sanskrit, Upanishad essentially means that Upavisha, Upanisha also means that one only. Sit closer to the teacher. Right? It brings consciousness. It brings that idea of the ultimate truth which they spoke about as Brahman and Shankara in his Advaita Siddhanta or the Vedanta that he talks about non-dualism is the significant branch among. The other two also, there is Vishishtha Advaita and you have Dvaita. All of them, they are also equally important. 
Now, uh, Sankhya is the oldest school of thought that provides the dualistic framework distinguishing between the Purusha and Prakriti. They have also contributed in their own way. I am just showing you the diversity that we have. We have never agreed with one saying this is the ultimate truth. We have always found, we have always believed where there is way, there is another way. Not that this is the only way. The only way is end of learning, end of progress of human societies. And our tradition has never been that one. That's why yoga, nyaya, everything, all of them have been in one or the other way, that one only. In the heterodox school, we have also celebrated Charvak, who did not believe in anything, yet we are studying. We had so many kings and so many people patronizing us, we could have used them and we could have said, put an end to this. These Nazikas are dangerous. We have not done that. We are celebrating, in fact. Even today, we allow them to celebrate. That is the tolerance that we are talking about. That human value, that universal value which we are talking about. With regard to scientific and mathematic contributions, you can look in here. The ratio of the circumference of a circle and all these things that Aryabhata spoke about. Now people are pulling out from Varaha Mira to everyone. You can see in the astronomy, we have spoken about Varaha Mira's encyclopedic work on astronomy and astrology. How did they did not have any telescope when they used to write the Panchang? One year before they were writing, when will the eclipse happen? Now, five days before only they are telling you some sort of an eclipse will happen. How did? Was that a mathematical calculation or did they have any telescope? How did they know the universal movement of the, of the planets? How were they so accurate? How did they speak about it so clearly? Lack of evidence is not evidence lacking. We need to dig it up. We need to go little more deeper. Sushruta Samhita. My friends in Ayurveda say what they know about Sushruta Samhita, what it is talking about is not even 5%. They say in, in Ayurveda, we use ghee and honey. These two have extraordinary values. And my friend says we know 2% of how to use ghee and honey. We don't even know 98% of the usage. Because they are supposed to be the most valued one. We don't know anything about it. Sushruta Samhita, Charaka Samhita, each of these things about the medical knowledge to everything. That comes in the Indian knowledge system. Metallurgy that we are talking about, you can look at the wood steel that we are talking about. Or the iron pillar in Delhi. Our houses get rusted in 10 years. And that fellow comes, a film hero comes and tells you the best TMT bar <laughs> in advertisement. He is not there when your house is falling. Now, now actually government of India is mooting something on these advertisements. That when they come and endorse and we believe in them anyway, they are our national heroes. Am I right? So that fellow comes and tells the greatest one, the strongest TMT bar and he sells you. And the TMT bar is not sustaining for 10 years. There is an iron pillar that comes from millennials. How is that? That we don't know. Vedic literature, if you look in, we have the Vedas composed in Sanskrit and from there so many other things have come. That's why I say those languages that came to challenge that one, where are they today? Prakrit came as an alternative to Sanskrit. Where in India Prakrit is being spoken? And you will also be surprised that Sanskrit doesn't have a slang. Right? Sanskrit is same all over. Where is it? Am I right? Then epic poetry, we have the Mahabharata, Ramayana and so many other things. We have accepted everything. We have the classical literature of Kalidasa, one of the most beautiful one. Right? That's why everything that is written in Sanskrit is not sacrosanct. There are romantic poetries also. Everything in the Navarasa that you require is there in Sanskrit. Not everything is sacrosanct. Kalidasa wrote about romance also. Kalidasa wrote about the spiritual romance with the mother as well. We have heard his famous shloka, right? Manikya Veena Mupalalayanti Madala Samanjula Magmilasa. He writes, you know, this is like a Padapunja. If you look at the Vakarana that is there, that he has used, that's like the mantra extraordinarily written. I'll just show you a small one. The Tamil Sangam literature, the land that you are sitting here, then Panini's Ashtadhyayi, extraordinarily built one. Right? Today, if you ask me, ask someone, which is the easiest and the best one for coding, they'll tell you Sanskrit only. You ask anyone, you ask Germans, they'll tell you. 
but it is the one which is the best for coding they say because it is systematic you ask the french what's your opinion about english they'll say it's the most haphazard language because there is no clarity right once dr radha krishnan was asked by one of the british men saying that when he was ascertaining and telling that in english there is only one or two words where we pronounce su as shu s u g a r is sugar not sugar how is it then witty radha krishnan asked him back are you sure because sure is also s u r e right so that person said the only word in english where we pronounce su as shu so we say sugar so radha krishnan asked back are you sure and there ended the conversation it's beautiful so that is the language that we belong to but english is a very haphazard language there are so many things they unnecessarily add to there are confusions about it that's exactly what we are going through because you think in your mother tongue which is more systematic convert it to english it becomes a distortion it's not the problem for your mother tongue your mother tongue is correct your mother tongue is systematic your mother tongue is grammatically correct english is not grammatically correct that's a problem that's why but we tell people that don't think in your mother tongue speak in english because after a point of time you will invariably blame that i think in my mother tongue that's why english is becoming like this it's not your mother tongue's problem please realize it is english's problem that's the problem here okay just this is the one which i said kalidasas he says manikya veena mupalalayantim just read that you will feel madalasam manjula vagmilasam he says and it goes on extraordinarily beautiful uh, writing that from kalidasa that comes in so grammatically well written and extraordinary in in terms of the recitation as well some potential trends which is essentially on digital integration i mentioned already uh, that's why i don't want to spend time on that one how we can integrate and yet we can take the spiritual path and take the renaissance forward revival and fusion that is also a possibility sustainability and eco consciousness now technology cannot be for not the buzzword that we are using now sustainable growth is the buzzword every university has been pushed everybody has been pushed right asking for sustainable development goals sdg sdg SD. this is what we said long ago nobody listened now it has come from there no governance and good governance if governance itself was supposed to be good what is good governance right then global influence there is going to be global influence whatever goes there and comes we need to embrace that one there is no possibility yet we need to be rooted and we need to take care diversity and inclusion wellness and spirituality take it from me down the lane it will come back round and round like the way yoga has happened it will come back here only it will come back to here only and indian healing systems is bound to come back and it will take care but there are going to be influences from the pop culture and our colonial mentality because in a marriage when somebody comes from elsewhere and six we pay 45 crores and the fellow who sang here only was paid 5 crores right in the big fat marriage that we all felt jealous about language preservation that is the last one in the language preservation as well that's one of the reasons why now they are trying with the government of india is trying to develop indic knowledge system so that you are rooted you feel proud about your mother tongue you will feel proud about the regional languages yet have that universal acceptance and orientation i'll stop with that one thank you for your patience